So what I'm going to do today is to talk about or broach certain issues in a provocative way so that we open the envelope for discussion, for broader discussion on political economy aspects of reform. I, I must start by admitting that I am not the expert of Pakistani economy. Uh, I'm increasingly focusing on political economy of the Middle East, but because I teach political economy at Oxford, it might allow you or afford you a distant perspective because it's in my own country and constantly thinking about it. Uh, but because I've been teaching for over 12, 13 years, uh, political economy of institutions and development, I'm going to present to you some humble observations that might, um, uh, you know, set the stage for, for discussion. I believe that a lot of debate that is taking place in Pakistan on economy, it's obviously at the front and center of every major newspaper, every major talk show. Um, and we have a lot of uh, scholars like myself, more established scholars like uh, Atif Mia, uh, Asim Khaja, Ali Chima, a lot of people who've uh, been thinking about economy. But I think one perspective that's so far lacking in terms of the popular discourse is political economy is the way in which Pakistan's economic problems are fundamentally interconnected with uh, politics and I would say also geopolitics. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to assume two things. I think all of us in this room would recognize that economy is fundamental to the security uh, of the country. Right? So whichever way we define national security, economy is a fundamental component. I think there's broad agreement even amongst those who hold real power in this country, that economy is a central flank of that. So I'm going to assume that. I'm not going to belabor that point. The second is that we have broad understanding of what needs to be done to fix individual sectors of the economy, right? So we have the former chairman of the Planning Commission, uh, Shokat Saab himself was in the Planning Commission. We know in many different parts of the economy, from agriculture to industry to electricity crisis, we have lots of reports, right, uh, including on the circular debt. We have excellent reports that have been compiled. So we have technical understanding, broadly speaking, on how to fix different sectors of the economy. What we do need to talk about is political incentives, elite incentives. And my own research into political economy over the last decade and a half convinces me that the central issue in thinking about development, uh, especially of low-income states like Pakistan, is what are the elite incentives, what governs them, what prevents change, what can force them to, uh, uh, to, to begin a process of change. And so it's really using the Ron Achimoglu's term, you know, how can you really think about good economics, that is good politics too. I don't have the answers, but I'm going to open the envelope of discussion. And therefore, a lot of my insights today are going to be macro political economy. You know, there are, of course, all sorts of insights that we have already. I mean, on agriculture, uh, Sataj Aziz, a long time back, made a massive report on, you know, 500 page report what needs to be done on agriculture. I used to work with Mahmoud Haq, he was talking about Benami assets in those times, right? Uh, it's still presently uh, a topic of our debate. Uh, he's been writing about regressive structures. So there are a lot of microeconomic insights that we know, but I need today to focus on macro political insights. Okay, so I think the first thing is to realize where we are. And my sense is that fiscally speaking, as a state, we are really running the affairs as a fiscal Ponzi scheme <coughs> because it's a borrowed existence, it's unsustainable, and without continuous injections of outside support, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult to survive. And this particular fiscal situation is imposing real costs on three major segments of society. Is obviously the poor who have to pay a lot of taxes, you know, indirect taxes, regressive taxation structure, higher prices. They're the future generations because when you're borrowing money, we are really on borrowed existence, you are effectively imposing or passing on the cost to future generations. And the third aspect, which I think is now becoming growingly clear, is that the present state of affairs is actually imposing costs on productive sectors of the economy, right? Uh, whether it's the energy crisis, whether it is the way in which 
trade policy is used to generate taxation. There are all sorts of ways in which the way we manage our fiscal house is now imposing heavy costs on the productive sectors of the economy. Now, classic illustration of this is, you know, this is from Raza Bakir's presentation, actually, where he decomposes growth in Pakistan according to consumption, investment, exports, imports, and GDP. And one of the startling facts here is, which most people know, is that growth is highly volatile, right? So if you're thinking about sustained growth, Pakistan has not, uh, you know, enjoyed sustained growth so far. The second key aspect of this plot is this blue bar, which is telling you about consumption, the growing and important role of consumption-oriented expenditures, industries in sustaining the economy. When it comes to investment, when it comes to exports, we are really lagging behind. Investment is stagnating. Exports, as we all know, have been declining. Um, and uh, large-scale manufacturing <coughs> has been contracting. This is, uh, we already know about that. And once you come to Pakistan after, uh, you know, several months, you know, I come once a year or so, one of the things you notice is that you open the newspaper on Sunday, literally every second page has big advertisements on real estate uh, projects. And it tells you about how much of the capital gain for our elites and for middle classes is being generated in a sector which, at least broadly speaking, um, it, it does not provide a very sustainable foundation for growth. You know, it's fine, you know, uh, we are a growing economy, we are urbanizing, there's an expanding middle class, there's demand for, uh, uh, for real estate, but an economy that is largely dominated by real estate interests uh, is problematic. We can talk about it uh, in due course. So a lot of the growth has come, if you look at the Musharraf era, uh, it's come from banking, services, real estate, even during Nawaz Sharif's government, even during Parvez Musharraf's government, uh, Parvez Saab will know a lot better, large-scale manufacturing has largely been stagnant. Either negative growth rate, very or very small uh, growth in real terms. Since 2003, we've also seen falling exports. Um, agriculture, a lot of potential, but remains unrealized. And we can add on to that list. You know, one area that's particularly evident in the trade policy, if you look at tariff, uh, average MFN tariff rates, they've come down. So we've kind of liberalized trade uh, considerably. But since the signing of the GSP Plus in 2013, we've seen an increase in the share of non-tariff measures, which are hurting our exports. We, we don't have any real analysis so far on what is the impact of these non-tariff measures, but this is a process I've uh, followed in Morocco, in Algeria, in Egypt. In each of these cases, trade liberalization agreements with the European Union are a mixed bag. You know, they allow you access, concessionary access to European markets, but they create requirements for non-tariff measures, which are regulatory barriers. They can facilitate trade, but they are hugely selectively enforced, with the result that politically connected actors or powerful uh, industries can have them uh, have better enforcement than others. So we need to study that. But in general, what you see is since 2013, you see falling exports, the red line, um, and of course the, 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 the current account deficit obviously is increasing. Now, within this milieu, you could see that Pakistan is following one of the most interesting trade policies in the world, right? We've got tariffs, we've got non-tariff measures, we've got regulatory duties, we've got SROs. It's a hodgepodge. And, uh, you know, there is hardly any communication between the Federal Board of Revenue and the Ministry of Commerce, because the Revenue Ministry wants to use trade policy to generate revenues, whereas the Commerce Ministry wants to increase exports, there's no uh, a coordinate policy. But again, you could see that the fiscal situation, which creates an imperative to generate revenues through trade policy, uh, a policy that is now being revised by this government, um, actually creates a real uh, crisis for these sectors. These are all illustrations of the crisis that we are in. But I think we can start by thinking about, and I think again, most of the stakeholders in this country would agree that this is an unsustainable situation because the growth rate that we have presently in the economy is outpaced by population growth rate, right? It's not sufficient to generate opportunities for the uh, number of young people 
who are coming on board. Uh, there are assertive middle classes, urbanization, you know, the present uh, economic order doesn't allow uh, the inclusion of this large claimants of, uh, uh, of people. And there's also shrinking base of domestic production. I mentioned real estate. The real estate is also eating into our agricultural base, right? And you now see as there's, uh, you know, uh, upper ceiling hits in these major urban centers, now you have housing societies in our uh, agriculturally rich areas like uh, Multan, like uh, Central Punjab, Gujranwala, these are places which are very important for agricultural base. And external rents, which our elites have typically relied on, are also shrinking. You could see how the FATF and the IMF program itself is being carefully coordinated in ways to squeeze the lead a little bit, uh, especially in light of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So in the midst of all these factors, it doesn't require an economist to convince you that this order is unsustainable. Because if you maintain this equilibrium, it means you're going to have growing inequality and a lot of violence. Now, the two contentions I want to make is that now the time <coughs> for taking isolated approaches to individual sectors, here is this agricultural package, here is this export package, here is the package to revive industry, I don't think it will work anymore. We've reached a point where the, the, the returns to, to doing these little projects are becoming more and more limited. We need to redefine the basic governance model through which growth is generated. And we need a more holistic development strategy which takes a cross-sectoral approach. I generally feel that it's no longer possible to revive exports through just an export package. You need to fundamentally redefine the governance model and look at the economy as a larger whole, as a coordinated development strategy. I think if there's one economic consensus that exists in this country over time, and I used to work with Mahbub al -Haq, he was used to always highlight that there's huge elite capture in the economy. Right? Our economy suffers from massive elite capture. At that time, Ishra Hussain was at the bank and uh, 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 and Pasha Saab was actually running the show. He was the deputy chairman of the planning commission. And, uh, you know, now they're also saying the same thing. So the broad consensus that our economy, because of the nature of elite exemptions, whole range of the ways in which sectors are uh, work, it suffers from elite capture. It's a broad consensus. What many of these people didn't talk about, which I think is very critical, is that what sustains this elite capture? And in my opinion, it's the interplay between domestic power holders and external stakeholders. Because the incentives for elites to reform, because there's no real fire under the feet of the ruler to say, I really need to change the way of doing business. So every four or five years down the line, we have an IMF program. And that IMF program is often negotiated by the military and the outside stakeholders. So the Americans and the military, they pretty much agree that there's going to be an IMF program. Then the rest is just for the IMF and the local stakeholders to work <coughs> out. That really undermines the incentives for reform. Because if those who hold real power in any country, if they know they can get the money without genuinely reforming, they were never going to reform. And this game plays on. This game, as I argued in one of my Al Jazeera articles, <coughs> suits both the outside stakeholders as well as domestic elites. It supports outside stakeholders because every five years down the line, they can extract a geopolitical concession. It supports domestic elites because it gives them a way out of the tough economic reforms, which will hurt their own interests as well. Now, we know that sectoral policies are captured by various vested interests, right? So if you talk about agricultural policies, is the Farmers Association of Pakistan or the likes of Tareens and, and Khusra Bakhtiar who will, who will shape. If you talk about export packages, we are mostly talking about Aptama and these large uh, groups. If you talk about capital markets policies, it's the Akhil Karim Dedi whose support is required to appoint anybody to head the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, if it's the real estate sector, it's just a few actors who will decide what real estate for. So you have the development sector captured by both foreign donors uh, who are floating around and have different kinds of policies in play. So effectively, we have different parts of the economy 
where different actors are staking their claim. There is no coordinated or coherent development vision uh, that could be offered for this country. And I think that brings me to an important point. In this country, we've had a lot of debate on civil military divide, right, in the political domain. I think when it comes to core political economy concerns, there's no civil military divide. Right? And I would have said this even before the extension episode, right? Because, you know, the structure of regressive taxation, culture of tax exemptions, the new crony capitalist structures of economy, right? Sugar being a prime example, but you can offer lots of examples. Development spanning the way in which it's politically captured, uh, the role of the land brokers who are in every uh, dispensation, circular debt, we know what we need to do, but you know all actors are, are part of the problem. So when it comes to fundamental issues, there is no real civil military divide in this country. And I think that's an important point to bear in mind. And that takes me back to the to the larger political economy literature of the type that Daron H. Boglu, James Robinson, Why Nations Fail, Narrow Corridor, or series of papers that we've been writing about. And a fundamental contention of this literature is that there's always a disparity between private interests and social welfare. And it explains why inefficient institutions persist, right? We know that we need to increase the base of taxation, right? After all, all our tax experts, economic experts have been talking about it, but it won't happen because uh, of this uh, essential problem, which I think is the social conflict view of institutions, which is to say that inefficient institutions and policies are chosen because they serve the interests of politicians and social groups that hold political power at the expense of the rest. And this commitment problem is very simple. It's an academic jargon, but the basic idea is Imran Khan, for example, when he was not in power, he said he is going to uh, uh, stop this practice of development spending through MNAs, MPAs. He's going to think about conflict of interest. He's going to talk about other reforms. But once you're in power, it's very difficult because if you implement these reforms, including local governments and right all those sorts of reforms, you will undercut your own power. And that is called the commitment problem in politics, that for politicians, and their pronouncements, they lack credibility because ex post, they're unlikely to carry out those reforms because they will hurt themselves uh, by carrying out those reforms. That commitment problem of reform is hugely important in the Pakistani context. And I've given you examples of, uh, you know, the PTI stance on development spending, conflict of interest, police reforms, devolution, expansion of the tax base, which was a big plank, uh, a circular debt, right? And I think it's not just the, the Pakistan Tehrik and Saf that will have the problem. Every political government will have a problem to carry out. Because no political government, no elected government can solve this commitment problem. Because it will always have incentives uh, not to undertake those reforms that it promises. Now, that's where it's important to think about elite incentives, right? Wherever you have seen reform being implemented, in any context, elite incentives matter a great deal, right? If you look at the glorious revolution in England, which ushered a period of industrialization, you had the Whig coalition. And in that Whig coalition were members who had factories, who had direct stakes in the promotion of industry, right? They had direct interest in carrying out policies that will enhance the productive power. You can think about the Chinese Communist Party today, despite all the problems, their incentives are aligned with the expansion of the economic pie, right? And the particular reforms they undertake, again, solve that incentive alignment problem because it's a massive country. You have a lot of regional devolution. Turkey is a, is a classic example. You know, have you ever thought about how economic transition has taken place in Turkey is represented by a move from the margins to the mainstream? You know, a lot of these firms that are called Anatol, uh, Anatolian Tigers, right? These are firms that are on the periphery of Turkey. They are now challenging the big guys who used to control Izmir, Ankara, Istanbul, right? And these are small firm, medium enterprises. These are export oriented. These are fast growing. These are younger firms. And because the, the, the revenues they are generating then led to the creation of uh, uh, you know, mobile platforms, media outlets, print newspapers, 
industry associations, right? Um, you know, Musiad, for example, this is the Association of Industries in Turkey. It's all captured by these new actors. And Erdogan, wherever he goes, he takes 200, 300 businessmen along, right? Why? Because he knows that if those interests that are export interests are crucial for the survival of his political coalition. And so you see a perfect alignment between the interests, the political interests of parties and the creation of new industry interests whose incentives are aligned with the promotion of industry. Now, in that perspective, one element that I think is really missing in the Pakistani debate is the incentives of those who have coercive power. One of the best books in political economy, I think, is this very brief volume by uh, Robert Bates on prosperity and violence. And the basic insight of that book is that political economy structures in countries shift when those who have coercive power begin to throw their weight behind productive enterprises. And it's the experience of Europe. There's also a lot of other literature on institutional transitions that argues that institutional transitions often come about as an incentive compatible process, which is to say that elites pursue reforms that are aligned with their own interests, right? And that is why if you look at, for example, Britain's industrial revolution, it was a move from exclusive privileges for the elites to universal rights, right? It was an incentive compatible process. And that's why Asimoglu and Robinson, when they talk about change, they say, well, change usually happens when they're revolutionary constraints on elite preferences. In other words, when there is fire under the feet of the ruler, when reform becomes imperative for the ruler's survival. Right? And therefore, I think in Pakistan, we need to broaden the horizon of discussion to think about incentives of those elites who have coercive power, who can make decisions, who can enforce them, right? who can get things done. And that's why I think in the Pakistani context, at least in the academic world, I know in our country, it's a very sensitive issue, but I think in the academic debate, in public policy debate, we need to broach constructive ways to talk about reform and bring in actors who are crucial for it. And in that respect, I think when I study political economy and teach political economy, it's absolutely central for me to argue that if you want to have genuine fiscal capacity in this country, the biggest stakeholder in principle should be the military. And why it isn't. Now, it is, should be the main stakeholder for reform, obviously, because it is precarious to maintain a large standing army without sustainable revenue base. If you have a country with only a million people paying direct income taxes, you can never really build a strong military, right? And if you look at the European experience of fiscal capacity, it's intertwined with the incentives of those who had coercive power. It was Europe's imperative to build a standing army, to engage in wars that forced them to build fiscal capacity. Well, then the question is, why is it that in our country, the military so far has not been incentivized that, in that way? And in my humble opinion, two factors help to account for it amongst others. <coughs> One, of course, is the excessive reliance on external rents, because historically, our country, because of being part of different, you know, you could call it the liability of our geography, because of our geography allows elites to derive rents that are unearned income streams, right? You sign up on the on the right geopolitical platform, you will get a lot of access to rents, right? It was the Cold War in the, in, in the 50s and 60s. It was the Afghan War in the 80s and 2000s. Is the new China, uh, uh, China threat. Uh, in each of these cases, you could see the country's geography allows the elites to derive these rents, which undermines their incentives to, to put their weight behind a uh, genuine fiscal reform. And of course, another aspect is the military's growing presence in the economy, which prevents us from acting as a neutral third party stakeholder in reform. And some of my discussion today would be to, to say, how do you tame the Leviathan? How do you start a discussion that is honest, constructive, not influenced by any agenda setting by any of the actors, but in the larger national interest of the country? Now, in this is a lot of work already been done on Pakistan on how aid, foreign aid 
is a moral is a major moral hazard problem, right? In economics, we define a moral hazard as a problem when you got, once you get insured, you become reckless. So Egypt and Pakistan are key states that are moral hazard that suffer from this moral hazard problem because they recognize that they are too big to fail, almost like the banks that were saved in the wake of the 2008 financial mm -hmm. crisis. And so this plot by a young scholar uh, Fahim, uh, Dr. Fahim Khan from Pied, illustrates the problem. Right, so you have these. Uh, uh, peaks and troughs of growth rates. And in most of the periods when you had high periods of economic growth were also periods where you had high levels of foreign aid inflows. And in each of those cases, there were often periods uh, of military rule. Now, this is a central slide in my presentation, is a central argument that I'm gonna make, is that the military's dilemma as we stand today is twofold. It wants to control both economy and politics, but it can only control one. It cannot control both. We have reached a point where the military can either control economy or it can control politics. And the reason for it is that if you pursue genuine economic reform, it is going to hurt its ability to control the political domain, right? You want to raise agricultural income tax, it's going to hurt the electables. If you're going to reform the sugar market, is going to hurt your ability to fund new political coalitions, right? Tareens and others will not be on the side. Um, and I can give you lots of different examples of how genuine reforms are going to implement. And NAB is a classic example, right? So we put uh, uh, Fawad Asim Fawad in jail. Yes, it helped to change the political dynamic, but it hurt the investor climate, right? So you could achieve political outcome, but you killed the economic outcome. And similarly, uh, a lot of pro-competition reforms, now we know because the military's own uh, uh, presence in the economy can also be, uh, be affected by it. So the only time when the military can control both economics and politics is when there's a big geopolitical project and when there is a military coup. Because then there are enough money coming in to satisfy elite claimants and pass on development expenditures to the poor. But I think in our country, we are reaching a stage where we need to open a new envelope for discussion on this subject and ask, look, we cannot have both. And this, need, this requires that we have a new discussion on economy and national security that is organized around those trade-offs. Otherwise, we'll be beating around the bush. I think what we are facing today, uh, through my own understanding of the Middle East, is we are, we are facing a Botiflika moment. Uh, Botiflika was, uh, was the president of Algeria. And if you have any Algerian friend, he will tell you that the country is such a perfect rent-seeking structure that its presidency was half dead for the last 10 years, but the system kept running. So he was almost a corpse in the street. And that's why when the Algerian Spring last year arose, it was the insult that people received when he re-announced his candidature for, for running as a president. And people said, well, it's enough, right? He's almost dead, he never appeared, he didn't make any appearance on the television for the last five years of his rule. I think the system we have is like that corpse, both of Flickr's corpse, which is there, people think is alive, but is actually dead. And we are constantly resuscitating that system. And I think that pro provides to me a good imagery to think about it. Now, what are the potential pathways to reform? And again, let me allow to be more candidate, uh, candid and, um, and provocative. I could be wrong, but I want to open an honest uh, discourse on this subject. I think the very absolutely essential thing we need is a debate on how you can diversify the rent sources for elite actors in this country. As I said, mostly they have relied on land markets for generation of rents. You take any country in the world, growth often happens in those industries where elites are earning their capital gains. You look at Ethiopia, you look at um, uh, Turkey, you look at Brazil, you look at uh, China. These are sectors where people are thinking and talking about subjects and actively competing in those markets where you have, uh, uh, where you can earn capital gains. Now, this is a very, very difficult political economy subject. Because you know, how can you incentivize elites to shift their focus 
to those areas of the economy where the participation expands the pie rather than competes in a shrinking pie, right? Real estate is a finite resource and in a way we are, we are competing in a shrinking pie. How can we shift elite actors away from that into those other sectors where you can A, expand the pie, two, because of the presence of the elites, you can create coordination platforms. You need to create collective coordination platform uh, that could solve these failure, right? When we think about coordination failures, Pranab Burden talks about coordination failures as the most central challenge in any country's development, which is to say, you know, you want to, uh, you know, improve agriculture, okay, you provide water, there is an interlinked challenge with the, uh, with the credit, there's an interlinked challenge with the markets, right? So any area you identify, you want to make a reform effort is linked with a series of uh, interlinked challenges. And I feel that one area where we need to have a discussion for elite actors, particularly the military, to have greater stake is export-oriented industries, especially those export-oriented industries that are non-traditional export sectors, right? Where the military can help to create platforms. We know the international, you know, for example, the CIA, the US military, the Chinese, lots of them are involved in those sectors of the economy, whether it's IT or their non-traditional, certain non-traditional sectors of the exports, where the state has a relative advantage in terms of setting the platform. And that transition is important because you have a huge organization um, whose survival is crucial for the state to survive. If you don't have the military, you have a country like Iraq. <coughs> You're going to be like, like Libya. So you need the Leviathan, but you need to tame the Leviathan and gradually shift it to those sectors of the economy where it expands the productive pile. Right? And you also have a large officer class who retires early on. They need opportunities. Now, this might be a pipe dream. This might be not very well thought out, but I think it's the sort of line of argumentation that we need to think about. If you're going to think about that the elites will leave, vacate a sector that is generating massive rents, like the real estate, it's not going to happen. It's not happened in other countries. It will not happen here, short of a conflict or a major crisis. So we need to think about how do you make that transition and shift elites to that. And I think it, the basic insight I'm using from political economy is that in often outcomes depends on how much of these rent transfers goes to individuals or groups who have the incentive and the opportunity to make the transition to a more productive economic frontier. So James Robinson, for example, when he thinks about industrial policy, makes a very important argument when he says, well, industrial policy has been successful when those with political power who have implemented the policy have either themselves directly wished for it to succeed or have been forced to act in this way by the incentives generated by political institutions. Okay. And so the key thing is which interests are mobilized, what their interests are. And the way to think about it, perhaps, is Ethiopia today, right? The type of growth they're having, the new industrial strategies they're having, uh, part and part of parcel of it are the way in which elites have made a transition from an old communist era economy to a more state-oriented economy that is bringing the private sector in as well. And again, the incentives of, uh, 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 of the Communist Party is key to thinking about it. Now, there are lots of other examples about it, right? Um, take any story for industrialization. It's always involved creating rents for spoilers, right? So if you look at the technological dynamism in large conglomerates in Japan, they had to keep the Japanese LDP party at bay and give them some unproductive transfers so they don't spoil the game. Uh, if you look at Europe, Western Europe, there have always been rent-sharing arrangements between ruling families, civil servants, merchant capitalists, right? Uh, you look at Malaysia, the way in which rents are transferred from ethnic Malays to Malay middle classes, they're crucial to keep the political coalition uh, in, intact. Uh, and these are what social scientists call cooperation contingent rents, right? So you need the cooperation of these spoilers so that they don't spoil the, the, the growth game. Uh, there are all sorts of other ways to think about it. Roderick, for example, would call them 
second best institutions. Or uh, Land Pritchett talks about how countries make a transition from a closed order to an open access uh, environment. Now, all of this effectively uh, means that we need to shift the economy's institutional incentive structure so that the capital gains for elite classes are generated in those areas that expand the productive frontier, right? And that utilize the real competitive strengths of the economy. And for that, the very minimum that is required is a new cross-party political coalition, almost like people used to talk about Misake Jamhuriyat and Misake Maishat, right? Uh, you need a political coalition for thinking about that. And for that, one can identify those areas of reforms which will benefit everyone with their real policy externalities because they will benefit anyone but each party on its own stands to lose. So, for example, we are talking about taxes on traders, right? You need to have some sort of GST taxation. No political party can take the risk, you know. If this government takes, is the trader interests of PMLN that will come on board. If the PMLN undertakes that reform, other interests, you know, their own core interests will challenge it. But the benefits of these reforms are shared by everyone. Uh, Planning Commission, right, reviving the Planning Commission, having a chief economist, having a proper cadre of professionals in the finance and debt ministries and the commerce ministries, that empty hole of capacity, if it's built up, is going to benefit everyone, right, whichever government comes in on board. So we need to think about those sorts of debates, larger political debates, um, which create infrastructures that benefit all, right, and create large externalities. I think there are some other issues that we need to talk about more broadly. One of which is I think the finance portfolio, the political class should agree, should always remain with an elected politician. Because I think one of the great ways in which we've lost our uh, advantage, our leverage, bargaining power, is from Mohammed Joab to Hafiz Sheikh, they're all outside appointed people who are uh, uh, brought to the country, they come on assignment, they come through the military or other international domestic arrangement. I think even the World Bank and IMF scholarship itself is telling us that you need a political buy-in for reform. A technocrat can never create a political buy-in for reform. Right? You need parties need to cultivate and prepare people uh, for this job. And if we have that sort of pact, that agreement amongst political parties, it will constrain the ability of outside actors to impose these individuals uh, uh, who have uh, very little, who are fly-in, fly-out finance ministers, effectively. I think another point which is very critical in political economy literature is that when you think about revenues, they're never a technocratic subject. They never have been and they never will. <coughs> Any country that has raised taxation, built fiscal capacity, it's always part of a political strategy. Because once you create taxation structure, it builds bargaining structures. If you're going to bring traders on board, you need to give them concessions. You need to have continuing interaction between them. And so one of the bigger failures of reform in our country is that every government has tried to pursue tax reform in a narrow technocratic way, taking into account donors, our own <coughs> federal secretaries, FBR. I think what we need is a broader discussion between different actors. <laughs> Political actors, elite actors who can who can pay taxes, but they cannot. Uh, people who enjoy from tax exemptions um, and have a larger discourse that look, this situation is unsustainable. If you are select, either you're going to have tax exemptions or we are go going to have a complete economic paralysis. We need to have a proper discussion around this subject. It's not about Shabar Zaidi or Hafiz Sheikh or few other individuals, a World Bank unit on, 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 uh, on tax reform. In fact, if there's one issue that the military or a political government should focus on is tax reform, leave all other sectors. And think about how do you create a revenue base which is you know, not too high taxes. You know, I know my friend Nadi Mullah doesn't like the word taxes, but I think ultimately for a state to have a sustainable basis, you need to have a basic taxation structure. And it goes back to the times of Ibn Khaldun. He said, you know, when a system is just, you have few taxes on a large number of people. And when it becomes extractive, you have large number of taxes on a few people. 
right? And he cast his story as, a, as essentially an issue of justice. And it is true, I think the nature of debate in our country on tax reform is very wrong, that even the prime minister said, very few people pay income taxes. That is not true. The issue is not tax collection, tax level, it's tax incidence. Who pays taxes? Because the poor are paying through indirect taxes, through inflation, through a whole range of other devices. The real issue in this country is tax incidence. And Air Kamal, for example, way back in time in Pied, had done this study in which he had shown that the incidence, the burden of taxation is negative disproportionately on the elites uh, compared to, to common citizens. And I'm sure uh, things would have gotten worse by now. I mean, we are talking about his study in 19, uh, early 1990s. So I think this is an important issue when we think about reform. We need to think about tax not just as a technocratic reform, but really something central to the survival of the state. I've already talked about major investment in state capacity, especially in areas that have a direct bearing on the economy. Uh, we have very weak coordination amongst ministries. Um, we need a different engagement with the donors. Today, I think the president of the World Bank has better lines of communications in Islamabad office with various line ministries. He has most of the, um, uh, uh, the secretaries in his pocket than the prime minister. We have created a situation where the lines between the donors and the government are really blurred. We don't know where the donor lines end and where the government begins. So we need to, and the only way we could do that is by creating better state capacity within our ministries, better technical capacity, including the capacity to monitor progress. Uh, just before the seminar, we were talking about how, you know, trade policy, some of the basic indicators are absent, right? So as an economist, if I want to work on trade policy, I need to know census of manufacturing data on how much is employment, value added. I need input output tables at ISIC four digit sectors. I need import demand elasticities. These numbers are not being generated. In a country that is suffering from a huge current account deficit problem and that is trying hard to revive its exports. So I think we really need an important data revolution. That's where donors can play a role, is they can demand this data, they can build this capacity uh, rather than uh, giving out money in, uh, in other ways. In some cases, donors are hollowing out state capacity. I mean, my own city, Oxford, has a company called Oxford Policy Management. It's hiring public servants, civil servants from Punjab on deputations. They work with them on higher salaries. Uh, it's hollowing out state capacity. And there's nobody in this country to say, to speak to them and say, look, you know, you've got to speak, you know, walk the talk. Uh, so I think that line has to be, uh, has to be uh, determined. And finally, I think we need a new industrial policy. Uh, that subordinates the state's domestic and external engagements to developmental needs, right? It's not an industrial policy that you create a support package for industry or a support package for textile. You need an overarching strategy, right? Which means even the foreign policy is part of it. Uh, you know, energy is a crucial requirement which is eating into our exports. Why is the Iran gas pipeline still off, off the radar? We know it's geopolitically difficult. But hey, we can negotiate with actors, say, look, this is unsustainable, you've got to help us. Iraq, I study Iraq, for example. Iraq, every six months, the United States gives an exemption to Iraq to purchase electricity from Iran. It's forced to do it because they're protests in Basra. Even in the height of the Cold War, Europe was purchasing electricity uh, and, and gas uh, effectively. From So I think there's a, there's a point where our elites need to engage with our partners, whether it's the United States or UK or others, that look, here are our crucial needs. We need to think about those questions uh, in fresh ways. But I think that will only happen if the elites seek concessions for the country's economy, not for themselves. The problem in our countries, and often in such cases, if there's a choice, they will seek a concession for themselves and say, let's put the other things back further. Okay, so I've got a few other slides which I'm happy to share with them on thinking about what role can bureaucracy play, uh, you know, how have bureaucracies played a role in industrialization. But allow me to conclude by, you know, talking about this fundamental aspect, uh, which, is, which is, um, is this particular bit, which is how do you really 
create fire under the feet of those who can take real economic decisions and incentivize them to consider the costs of the development strategy we are currently pursuing and that it ultimately is going to hit a wall, right? And it is in their own interest and the state's survival to start thinking about making a transition. Right? And I think the time has come that in our country we need to have those broader debates. Um, now, a lot of this perspective really is a perspective of someone who is slightly distant from Pakistan, who teaches political economy in Oxford. Some of these insights might appear very childish, but I thought it would be good to, um, uh, to trigger a debate, to provoke you a little bit uh, into thinking about these subjects.